Dr. Matt Fallensby, um, R1, who's of course going into anesthesia, um, is going to be discussing this topic. Cricoid pressure to prevent regurgitation in RSI, best practice or myth? Hey everybody. This is what I'll be uh, talking about today. So I'd, I'd like to just specify from the get-go, this is not for cord visualization. Some people will use cricoid pressure to pull down sort of anterior cords and intubation. So I'm not addressing that. Um, these are my disclosures, so I don't have any, but if anyone has <laughs> any disclosures they'd like to let me have, I'm, I'll be here all day. Um, so why do we do RSI? Um, and, and technically, the, the correct nomenclature is rapid sequence induction and intubation. It just doesn't sound as good if you put an extra I on there. Um, so basically, you want to intubate as quickly as you can to minimize time for aspiration in patients that are high risk for aspiration. Um, and uh, you know, basically minimize the time between induction and getting the cuff up. Um, I'm going to just kind of breeze through these. I have a lot of slides, so we're going to move at a pretty quick uh, clip here. But some reasons you would want to do this, um, imminent airway loss, anaphylaxis, failure of airway protection, you know, overly drunk person in the ED loses their airway reflexes, um, failure to ventilate, uh, like respiratory distress, so on and so forth, um, failure to oxygenate due to some of the above causes, ARDS, really bad pulmonary edema, or prophylactically like a very combative trauma patient, um, you know, coming in on whatever sort of drugs, um, use your imagination. And uh, indeterminate NPO status is really kind of the overarching theme here. So you know that they don't have an empty stomach and you know that they're at risk for aspiration. So the first time RSI was formally described was back in 1970 by uh, Stept and Safar there at UPMC uh, in, in Pittsburgh. Um, and so there's this handy dandy 15 step guide that we're gonna breeze through very quickly. Um, so get your IV access, check your equipment, put in an NG tube, and then it's controversial whether or not to remove it before you actually do the induction intubation. Clean the mouth and the pharynx and uh, remember to get their dentures out. Denitrogenate the lungs um, for at least a couple minutes. And then they describe putting the patient in a semi-sitting position uh, with like a 30 degree trunk elevation, which we don't see that often anymore. Um, and then apply your precordial stethoscope for cardiac monitoring, which we don't do very often anymore either. Um, and then induce, and then, so basically after you've done your induction agent, they recommend thiopental, um, it's a barbiturate. They recommend having an assistant apply cricoid pressure firm. Um, and then the idea behind this is that you'll close the esophagus, then you intubate, you put the cuff up, and then you can release cricoid pressure. And even if they regurgitate at this time, they'll have a cuff protecting them from aspiration. So I imagine it looks something sort of like this, you know, wearing, uh, wearing your, your, your coat while intubating. Um, but, you know, and with this slide, I really just want to kind of take some time to emphasize that this is still taught. So this, uh, this is sort of like the beginning Bible of anesthesia um, for a lot of trainees. This was published in 2011, and I just found three uh, different mentions of using cricoid pressure that are in, uh, highlighted there in yellow, um, with the caveat that they do have a section that it is contentious. So how do we do RSI today versus stepped in Safar back in 1970? There's no universal technique. Um, you could ask 10 different people and get 10 different answers. Um, we have slightly newer induction agents and paralytics. Um, we don't typically use precordial stethoscopes. Um, so this study by Morris and Cook back in 2001, I'll just breeze through this really quickly. It's just to illustrate how differently people do things. So this is kind of a check all of the above if you've used them in RSI. Um, 220 providers in the UK, a bunch of different induction agents, some thiopental, propofol, atomidate, ketamine, Versad. Um, in terms of the paralytic, 99% of people had used sucks. 30% um, of people also had used rock, and then a small um, number had used vecuronium. Um, sometimes people use succinylcholine and rocuronium in tandem. It's all over the board. Now, for the cricoid pressure in RSI, the timing of it, again, it's not universal whatsoever. So 71% of people waited until they thought loss of consciousness had occurred and then had cricoid pressure applied. 
22 people would actively choke their patients while they were awake. Uh, and 7% would just wait a good long while and then apply it. And 83% um, of people apply it with one hand. 17% would have two-handed application, which I didn't even know was a thing. <laughs> Um, and then this chart, I'm not, you know, I didn't put this up here to draw your attention to specific numbers, but this is the level of force in newtons, which I don't know how anyone actually measures when they do this in the survey. Um, it's all over the board, and it, it's not standardized on how many newtons you're supposed to use. And there's some people who use some nice descriptive terms like enough, uh, the force to break an egg, thumb force, <laughs> variable, and uh, unknown. So, it's good data. Um, so, cricoid pressure, AKA the Selleck Maneuver, um, originally described in 1961 by Dr. Selleck, who's a British anesthesiologist. He, his technique recommended that you empty the stomach contents with an NG tube, extend the neck to create anterior convexity, um, induce, paralyze, and have an assistant apply cricoid pressure. And he said the nurse or midwife Accompanying the patient can be shown how to do this in a few seconds. Sounds like robust. Um, and then you hold the cricoid between your thumb and the second finger and apply pressure with your index. Um, and he said you can do this, you can choke your patient and do this while they're conscious is tolerated. Um, and when you apply the pressure, be sure to not obstruct their airway because you'll know how to do that, certainly. And uh, you can also positive pressure ventilate the lungs while this is going on. Um, and maintain this pressure till you intubate and get the cuff up. This uh, picture here, there's a latex tube inserted down the esophagus filled with contrast, and the picture on the left is without cricoid pressure, the picture on the right is with cricoid pressure. So you see that latex tube with the contrast getting pinched down, that means it definitely works. So the data that he presented in his paper uh, he tried this on 26 people. Only three of them aspirated, and they only aspirated after he released pressure, and therefore he concluded it must work. And that is the foundation of using this technique in rapid sequence intubation. He didn't specify how much pressure. He said firm, um, and there have been papers showing a vastly different amount of pressure, 10 newtons to 44 newtons, which is one kilogram to four and a half kilos. He didn't really you know, very succinctly specify when you should time it. He said you could do it if they tolerate it while they're awake. Uh, he didn't specify induction agents, and most importantly, there were no controls. So this is a study by Smith uh, in 2003 looking at the actual anatomy via MRI of um, the esophagus with and without cricoid pressure. So at baseline, um, in 52% of people without cricoid pressure, the esophagus is already displaced laterally. So with cricoid pressure, um, it will be displaced laterally in 90% of patients in their series, typically about two-thirds of the time to the left, the other third to the right. Um, the larynx could also be displaced, and they also saw evidence of airway compression, which we'll get to later. This is a picture, so um, you can see that's the esophagus with cricoid pressure. You can actually see the, the person's fingers up top pressing down on the MRI. And remember, that happens about two-thirds of the time in 90% of patients to the left. So what is the body of evidence showing that cricoid pressure works? You're looking at most of it right here. Um, the first, one of the first papers was by Fanning in 1970. They used five human cadavers and two dogs and they put water down the distal esophagus and they measured the pressure uh, in this area until, and they applied cricoid pressure until things started leaking back up. Um, and they found that it prevented <coughs> leakage of, uh, of, of aspiration um, up to pressures of 50 to 74 centimeters of water in the stomach and esophagus. Past this, you'd start to get some reflux. Uh, unclear how old these cadavers were, and uh, two of the subjects were dogs. So. There were uh, similar studies done by Salem um, and Vanner, and they were all cadaveric studies. Um, 
They did not quantify the amount of cricoid pressure applied except for the Vanner study in 92. Uh, another study in 83, actually this time with live patients. Um, they had 24 adults going, undergoing surgery. They put an ET tube down connected to saline at various pressures that they could modulate and uh, they would apply cricoid pressure um, and measure it uh, with a yoke. I'll show you the picture in a second. Um, so 50% of people had no reflux at 44 newtons and 83% of patients had no reflux at 66 newtons, which is equivalent to hanging a 15 pound dumbbell on your neck. Um, other issues with the study, it's not really clear what putting an ET tube down the esophagus and the lumen that you're trying to occlude has. Uh, it was not an actual validation study. And um, the, the way, you know, it's, it's not realistic to actually measure your level of cricoid pressure unless you put like a scale underneath the, the head or something like that, which, you know, if you're handling a crash intubation is definitely something you'll keep your eye on. Uh, this is the yoke. This is a very comfortable looking apparatus um, that they would apply pressure with. And uh, that's how they measured it. Again, this is another problem with the study is that we don't use this in real life. You use this. So another possible limitation. So what are some of the issues that can come up with cricoid pressure um, once you've applied it? So the study um, Haslam et al. in 2005 wanted to measure how it affected the view when you're intubating. Um, so they put a rigid endoscope in the track of the laryngoscope and measured um, the anterior posterior distance of the cords and scaled that. Um, so basically, the different groups broke down to quarters. So there wasn't much change in a quarter of the subjects up to 60 newtons, which again is almost like a 15 pound dumbbell. Um, there was a progressive deterioration in about a quarter of the subjects in terms of the laryngeal view. There was initial improvement um, at low forces, which are questionably useful um, for occluding the esophagus, and then a progressive decline in the view in about a quarter of the patients. And then a quarter of the patients actually improved the view at higher forces above 30 newtons. A few more studies, um, Levitan 2006, uh, they did 106 cadavers. Again, they're cadavers, you have to take that data with a grain of salt, but um, cricoid pressure worsened the view in about 30% of their subjects. And Noguchi in 2003, this time with live patients, um, they used the Cook laryngeal grades and um, noticed that cricoid pressure caused no change in the view in about 43% of patients worsened it by one grade in 28% of patients and caused a two grade worsening in about a quarter of patients. So over half the patients uh, worsened their view and 5% of patients had actually improved the view. So other issues, um, you can actually compress the airway uh, and you may have to, if you, know, if you fail the intubation, you have to bag mask them. If you compress the airway, this can cause problems. Some data for this. Um, this study by Hartsilver in 2000 uh, had 35% complete obstruction, which they defined as a expiratory tidal volume under 200 mils at 44 newtons, so about a third of people. Um, a few other studies about airway compression, um, increased of the uh, peak inspiratory pressure um, by four centimeters of water with cricoid pressure in this Hawking study, so on and so forth. There are a number of other studies showing this. Another thing is lower esophageal sphincter tone. So if you press down really hard, this study in 1997 on eight patients, they actually took direct manometric measurements of the lower esophageal sphincter in the stomach, and they found that uh, at 20 newtons, the uh, cricoid pressure took the lower esophageal sphincter tone from 24 millimeters of mercury down to 15. If you increase that to 40 newtons, it goes down to 12. It's not entirely clear if that actually has significance, but it's data. Um, and if you release cricoid pressure, it brought it back to baseline. Um, gastric pressure remained the same. So other risks, there have been some uh, case reports showing esophageal rupture and um, case report and a cadaver study with 30% rupture rates. So the big question is where does this leave us? Um, you know, cricoid pressure has been handed down as sort of like a standard of practice in rapid sequence uh, induction intubation, but it seems like few people have taken the time to actually scrutinize where it came from, and we've been through pretty much all of the data that it came from. 
I would make the argument it's not very wholesome data. Um, we don't know when you should apply the force, how much force you should apply, um, and even if we did, doing it in these sort of crash intubations wouldn't be extremely practical. Um, there's also like an increased cognitive load on the intubating provider. Um, it's just another thing you have to juggle and manage. Um, the maneuver's never been validated to do what it claims to do. It's never been demonstrated to decrease rates of reflux. Um, it can potentially worsen the laryngeal view when you're intubating and um, releasing cricoid pressure to get a better view could potentially predispose them to regurgitation. Um, and you know, prolongation of your intubation time equals more possible time to aspirate. This is a picture of a T-Rex trying to intubate another T-Rex. It's very difficult for them to do. They have short arms. Um, and then just a couple more things. If, if you apply your cricoid pressure too early, you are basically choking your patient. And when you choke people, they can regurgitate. Um, and then you can also occlude the airway um, if you have to resort to bag masking or placing an LMA as a bailout technique. So where does this leave us? Um, it's not a practice based in evidence. It has its own risks, and it's been standard of practice in RSI teaching. So I'll leave you to your own conclusions. These are my references. Yeah, Daryl. Is there a variation among patients in the rigidity of the trachea? I'm not sure. It has been, I mean, there have been a few case reports of actually fracturing the cartilage. Um, so maybe. Here's the statement. Cricoid pressure should be used to prevent regurgitation and aspiration and rapid sequence intubation. So we can see there's not a lot of evidence uh, to support it. There's not a lot to refute it, although there seems like there's a fair amount of evidence that it could make intubation more difficult, um, which may actually increase the risk, um, certainly the risk of hypoxia and other problems. So I don't know, what do you guys think? How many think that uh, this is true? How many think it's plausible? How many think this is busted? Wow, all right. OK. Uh, before we go on, this is uh, just remind you the definition of dogma. And this is really dogma. This has been, we've been doing this for, since 1961. Um, with, you know, point of view or tenet put forth is authoritative without adequate grounds, and it's still in all the textbooks. So I guess uh, everybody's looking forward to this.